selected among uh, many, uh, let's say, good submissions this year. Uh, so we will start uh, with the three talks uh, in the undergraduate uh, session, and then uh, we will uh, uh, go to uh, the graduate uh, session. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, each uh, presenter uh, will have six minutes uh, to talk, and then uh, you will have uh, the audience will have three minutes uh, for questions. Uh, then we move to the next uh, uh, student presenter. Uh, please uh, mm, write your questions in the Q and A part of the uh, of the Zoom, and so we can ask the questions. Very young. I mean, I was um, I was twenty. Uh -huh. exactly. and my wife was 22 so uh i think there is some uh, some mic uh, issue if you could mute your mic you're not okay thank you so uh i think uh, without further ado we can start uh, the first talk is uh, by shishin song and uh, the title is uh, Profile Guided Branch Target Buffer Replacement for Data Center Applications. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Hello, everyone. I'm Shu Xing Song, an undergraduate student from the University of Michigan. Today, I'm going to present how to make the branch target buffer achieve a near ideal performance in data center applications with a novel profile guided replacement policy. Front end stalls usually refers to the pipeline slots when the processor fails to fetch instructions. In the beginning, I'd like to answer the very first question. Why do the front end stalls matter in data center applications like Google Web Search Service, Facebook, and Amazon? Let's take Google as an example. It's one of the most popular search engines. Google's web search serves billions of users and returns results for each query fast in about 0.5 seconds. This process depends on the large data centers owned by Google and it requires tons of computation resources. Thus, even one percentage performance loss would cause loss of billions of dollars and waste of energy, which accelerates the global warming. Furthermore, this application spans a large fraction of a processor's pipeline loss in waiting for the processor front end to fetch and return instructions. For example, as shown in this chart, Google's web search spends 24% of pipeline slots in front-end stalls. So there's much room for improvement on front-end performance, and it is necessary to reduce front-end stalls for saving money and protecting the environment. Then the next question we care about is how to reduce these front-end stalls. In order to achieve this goal, real-world processors employ fast directed instruction prefetching or FDIP. FDIP relies on the branch target buffer, shorten SVTB to cache branch targets, and predict instruction execution flow. However, with large instruction footprints, it achieves suboptimal performance due to numerous BTB misses. We show how much loss FDIP suffered by showing the speed up provided by Blandis optimal replacement policy over LRU replacement policy when applied to the BTB. The y-axis refers to the speed up, so the larger, the better. On average, the optimal replacement policy achieves 11% greater performance Hence, if we can apply a replacement policy that achieves near optimal performance, we can then improve IDIP a lot, seven billions of dollars. We then measure the performance of several state-of-the-art replacement policies, including SIIP, JHIP, and Hawkeye, and then compare it with the same IDIP baseline with LRU. This chart shows average speed up on nine applications, so the larger, the better. While the optimal offers 11% speed up on average, this existing replacement policies offers no more than 0.7 speed up. It's really a large gap between ideal and reality. Actually, this existing works fall short because they do not consider the access pattern bias among different branches, which we are going to illustrate next. To figure out why existing works fall short and make near ideal performance decisions, we characterize the branch access pattern with the optimal replacement policy. For each branch, we require a SPTB hit percentage when using Blandis optimal replacement policy. For example, here we have the branch A, B, and C. We find that branch A has a small hit percentage, branch C has a large hit percentage, while branch B has a medium one. 
Noting this, we can then put them into three categories, hot, warm, and cold. The colder a branch is, the higher probability that it will be evicted in the optimal case. Existing branch replacement policies do not consider this bias, so they just fall short when applying to the BTB. Driven by our analysis, we propose our profile guided solution. We have already shown the first step, where we provide the application with optimal replacement policy and get a hit ratio for each branch. The second step is to classify all branches into hot, warm, and cold according to the hit ratio in the optimal case, and then encode the case words with two bits. Next, to use this information at running time, we insert them into the original binary to generate a new one. Note that the x86 or ARM, they both have two unused bits reserved, so this will not introduce any overhead. We then modify the BTB hardware to allow the injected bits to guide replacement decisions. At runtime, it first identifies the coldest branch category in the target set and then evicts the least recently used one. We then measure the performance of HWC on nine widely used data center applications we mentioned before and compare the result with prior works and the optimal case. The y axis refers to the speed up over the RU, so the larger the better. While existing works only provides less than 0.7 speed up, our HWC provides 9% speed up. Compared with the optimal case, which provides 11% speed up, HWC achieves 80% performance of the optimal replacement policy and narrow the gap significantly. Furthermore, our profile guided HWC still achieves similar performance even profiled with different application inputs. In conclusion, we first show that the BTP replacement is crucial in improving FDIP performance. And then the optimal replacement policy achieves 11% speed up. Driven by the branch access patterns observed from this optimal case, we then propose our solution HWC. It first categorizes all branches into hot or cold according to the profiling results, then inject hints to binary and help hardware to make a near ideal optimal decisions at the running time. HWC provides an average 9% and up to 65% speed up over RU. As even 1% performance gain matters in data center applications, HWC will help to save billions of dollars. That's all for my presentation and thanks for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Shishan. It's perfect with 12 seconds to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, copy paste uh, into the uh, question and answer part uh, uh, of, of Zoom. Uh, I have a question. So how do you see, uh, the, let's say, the continuation of your work? In which direction you, 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 you see this work uh, moving? And it's, it's very nice. Uh, uh, that you you are you are dealing with the replacement policy and the instruction prefetch. How is the future? Uh, you mean that the future? Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, so you have mentioned the uh, BTP protection schemes, right? Yes. Uh, and actually, we have done some um, research on like whether the protection schemes can provide a speed up for BTP replacement policy, and we have a backup slide for this. Uh, but so, so you can see that for some uh, prior profession schemes like uh, like Confluence and Shotgun, and actually when they apply to the BTP, they actually doesn't work well for the data center applications. And this might be because they have introduced many branches, new branches into the branch target buffer, which means that we still need a more uh, smarter replacement policy to solve this problem. Actually, when we apply the optimal replacement policy, and then we combine it with the confluence and shotgun, you can see that the performance of these prefetching uh, schemes, they perform better, much better than before. Uh, that's my answer, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there, is, there are a couple of questions here. Um, what is the effect of BTV size on the performance of your scheme uh, is, is one question. Okay, I'll answer it live, and uh, I also have a, a slide for that. So there is a sensitivity analysis according to the BTB sets, and we have tried for the uh, so one kilobytes, two kilobytes entries uh, uh, until the uh, 33 kilobytes. Actually, uh, and we compare our result, uh, the small meter actually means the HWC, and uh, this 
uh, and then we compare our solutions performance with the optimal replacement policy. Uh, and this wax this refers to the percentage of the optimal speed up. And it's actually, uh, for some, uh, for some applications, it remains the same, but for some applications, it actually increased according to uh, when the DTP size increased. But uh, overall, it actually still outperforms the uh, existing replacement policy, such as SIP. Okay, thank okay. you very much. And uh, next, maybe they uh, to get this to help. Um, there's another uh, question, uh, so I... I would like to um, sort of in the remaining time, I would like to quickly uh, ask that, uh, how long did you profile your applications? Uh, and do you think this approach would also work for the data cache? Okay, so in our experiment, we apply the simulator champsing. And actually if, uh, if building the champsing in the release mode, it will like finish it in about, uh, about 10 minutes for each application. And, and actually we can run this simulation in parallel, like uh, run 10 simulations or 50 simulations at the same time. So it wouldn't take a long time. And for the, uh, yeah. And for the, because we use the simulator so they, we can actually man manage our banner hints, uh, the hints uh, sim uh, sim simply in our uh, simulator. And do you think uh, that HFC approach, I think it would work, uh, the similar approach would work for data cache, as long as maybe we can uh, inject some hints, uh, but it may need to like uh, some modification because here for the uh, BTB or the instruction cache, we, we can just insert these hints into the uh, binary, but for data, we cannot insert into the binary, but we can maybe use another, uh, something like, uh, like a, a history to record it, uh, to implement our approach. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Shishan. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so the next uh, presentation is Jim Su, uh, title is CNN-based position decoding from calcium images. Jim? Hello, yes, thanks for an introduction. One second. Okay, from start. Hello, uh, we are excited to present uh, machine learning based real time position decoding with calcium imaging. In vivo calcium imaging is a technique used to study neural activity in the brains of rats. Uh, a better understanding of neural activity can be the key to uncovering the inner workings of the brain. While prior works primarily focus on offline analysis of these calcium images, we target online decoding. This allows for the development of a range of neural feedback applications with closed loop feedback capability. The two most significant challenges for online decoding are the real-time nature and power constraints. During the experiments, a rat carrying the behavioral camera freely runs on a linear track, as we can see on the top left. The behavioral camera records the rat's position on the linear track, which is divided into 24 evenly distributed position bins. The bottom figure illustrates target and inference positions within a test session. Ground truth position is in blue and our decoded position is in red. In order to get a quantitative evaluation on the decoding accuracy, we employ a dedicated metric, which we call HIT-K. HIT-K reflects the possibility that the decoded position falls into the K nearest bins around the ground truth position. We map the 24 position bins on a linear track on a circle. The figure on the top right illustrates the accuracy metrics from HIT-1 all the way to HIT-9. Before decoding our calcium images, there are several necessary pre-processing steps to conduct. Our pre-processing flow uses the data acquisition hardware to send the calcium images from the behavioral camera to a customized processing pipeline on an FPGA. The pre-processing steps include motion correctness, 
image enhancement, and trace extraction. These steps are critical to good performance on the decoding task. We developed a machine learning approach to tackle the decoding task using a CNN model. After the pre-processing steps, we have converted our raw calcium image into a trace map, which is 32 by 32 concatenated into eight by eight cells. This is fed as input to our model. Our CNN model design is simple which is one convolutional layer and one fully connected layer. Yet it is competitive in accuracy with significantly deeper and more complex models such as ResNet 20, despite having less than half the size and number of weights. Next, we introduce an SNN-based model using a CNN to SNN conversion. This allows us to utilize highly optimized deep learning toolkits and backpropagation while exploiting the energy efficiency benefits of SNNs. Our SNN model converts activations from the CNN into spiking neurons using the integrate and fire model. For conversion, our first step is to maintain the first convolutional layer. And next, we convert each activation from the first hidden layer into a spiking neuron based on the integrate and fire model. And lastly, we use spike-based computation for the fully connected layer. The corresponding output neuron with the most spikes becomes our predicted bin. In terms of accuracy, our, our SNN model is competitive with our CNN model among all eight of our testing data sets, with each of them corresponding to a different rat and recording session. It outperforms another machine learning model based on the long short term memory or LSTM. One unique feature of a spiking neural network is its accuracy latency trade-off. Unlike a CNN, which has a fixed number of computations required for an inference, an SNN can adjust the amount of synaptic operations by increasing or decreasing the number of simulation time steps. By increasing the number of time steps, our decoding accuracy increases until it saturates by around 32 time steps. On the other hand, when we increase the number of time steps, it corresponds to a linear increase in the inference latency. This trend holds among all of our data sets. This accuracy latency trade-off makes the SNN decoder very flexible when it comes to meeting a wide range of different real-time processing requirements. Next, we implement accelerator designs for our machine learning kernels on an FPGA. Our optimization goals are to minimize resource utilization and latency. Our results show a clear trade-off between the CNN and SNN design implementations. While the SNN uses significantly less hardware resources like lookup tables, flip-flops, DSPs, and VRAMs, the CNN has a much shorter latency. And lastly, we deploy our SNN model on Intel Luigi, a neuromorphic chip with programmable synaptic learning rules. This allows our SNN to realize the full potential of asynchronous event-driven communication with specialized hardware. The end result is a 148 times improvement in energy efficiency and a 4.6 times improvement in inference time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, by the way, I think uh, the judges can ask uh, questions uh, directly, uh, and the rest of the folks can uh, submit questions through the Q&A. Uh, so uh, please, judges, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have questions for Jim. Hi, Jim. Thank you for that presentation. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question about one of the graphs that you showed. I don't remember which slide it was about all the, the tests you did. I'm curious to know what you think contributes to the difference in accuracy. Uh, yeah, so good question. So uh, I think the slide you're referring to is like the difference between the CNN and SNN, which are you know very competitive in terms of accuracy uh, versus an LSTM, which is has around a 10% uh, lower accuracy. So um, in terms of the first point as to why the CNN and SNN are very competitive, it's because um, we use a direct CNN to SNN conversion, which it, it, it basically very well approximates each of the activations in the CNN into the equivalent uh, spiking uh, neuron membrane dynamics. 
And a lot of prior literature has shown that um, if this is done well, you can get basically the identical accuracy with a very negligible accuracy loss. Um, as to why the CNN slash SNN perform better than the LSTM model, um, that might be a bit more difficult to have a specific reason why. Although I will say that definitely the CNN uh, model is like uh, a very good fit in terms of this specific decoding task, especially after the pre-processing steps. And I, I guess one last addition I do want to add is that we also compared um, our machine learning models with some more primitive uh, models, such as um, a linear classifier method. And we did find that the CNN performs better. Thank you, Jim. Uh, any other quick questions? What kind of uh, pre-processing do you do in the, in the input data to your uh, network? Right, so great question. Uh, let me let me find that slide. So for the pre-processing, um, if we were to directly try to apply our machine learning models onto our calcium image, um, we found that we had very poor accuracy. Um, as you can see in this slide, this is roughly what a raw calcium image looks like. And I imagine it would be a very, a much more difficult task for the CNN to be able to decode. Um, so the three steps we employ um, are motion correctness, uh, image enhancement, and then lastly, the contour-based trace extraction. Okay. Um, did you, sorry, did, did you try different mechanisms here of, of those three options or, or you took the, let's say- Yeah, so, so we found that all three of these independently um, did help to contribute to your accuracy and, and and when we put them together it has our best performance okay thanks mm -hmm. the last question but we are running out of time so if you can answer really quickly why does snn has a higher latency on fpga compared to cnn yeah, great question so so the reason why our snn model has higher latency even though most uh, one um, benefit of an SNN should, in theory, be the shortened latency, latency is that we're using a rate-based encoding where we need multiple simulation time steps in order to get um, a high accuracy performance. Um, so essentially what happens is that one activation value has to be approximated by multiple spikes. Um, so that's also a direction for future works, whereas um, as opposed to this rate-based encoding, which performs well in terms of accuracy, but not very well in terms of latency, we can explore more temporal based dynamics where the specific time that a spike is emitted um, also influences the model. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, then uh, we go to the last uh, talk of the undergraduate session uh, by Shadnam Sheikhmer, titled as Locality Aware Vector Indexed Architecture for Efficient Graph Processing. Shadnam, it's all yours. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, am I sharing my screen as well? All good. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shabnam, and I will be presenting La Via. Graphs are a widely used form of data representation. Since we can map graphs to their adjacency matrix, we can also map many graph applications to a series of matrix operations. The problem with modern graphs is that they are extremely sparse and extremely large in scale. To overcome sparsity, we used compression to store only non-zero values. To overcome scale, we use parallel architectures such as vector processors to exploit the inherent DLP. The problem with processing compressed formats on vector architectures is that these formats entail expensive pointer chasing. This makes the DLP irregular. In addition, vector architectures use um, expensive, um, expensive scatter gather operations, and this all leads to an increase in memory latency. To overcome this, we propose a novel hardware software co-design approach. On the software perspective, we use a partitioning scheme that exploits the inherent locality of graphs and increases the cache hit rate. On the hardware side, we use a smart scratchpad memory that utilizes the bandwidth. 
We propose LAVIA, Locality Aware Vector Indexed Architecture. So let's first examine the software perspective. Real world graphs have two important properties. First, they follow a power law distribution. Second, they exhibit a community like structure. We conclude that they have inherent locality. The question is, how do we exploit this locality? We have two objectives here. First, we want to process nodes in parallel with minimum synchronization overhead, meaning we don't want to have the same node in different parts of the vector lane simultaneously. This way, we can have guaranteed atomicity when processing these nodes in parallel. Second, we want to fetch the next node in a way that considers locality to increase the cache hit rate. To achieve this, we devise this partitioning scheme. First, we partition the graph into disjoint subgraphs, marking the inter subgraph edges. We can use any minimum cut algorithm to have balanced subgraphs. In the second step, we further partition the edges inside the disjoint subgraph into fixed length paths. The objective is to construct paths in a way that considers locality. For example, we can use a variant of depth first traversal, traversal that selects neighbors with respect to their um, degree. Now, how do we execute a graph algorithm on such a partition? In each iteration, since the paths from different subgraphs are disjoint, we can process them in parallel. After we have finished processing the subgraphs, we can proceed to processing the inter subgraph edges. Here is an example of the partitioning scheme. Here we have divided the graph into two disjoint subgraphs, and the black edge is an inter subgraph edge. Inside each subgraph, the different colors represent different paths. Now let's examine the hardware perspective. As we've mentioned, vector architectures use expensive scatter gather operations to implement pointer chasing. To overcome this issue, VIA proposes a smart scratch pad memory that stores dense vectors and intermediate results. However, VIA is good for operations where we only have one operations in a single iteration. However, graph algorithms include multiple operations in the same iteration. To overcome this, we extend the, the, the ISA with an instruction that manages this, and we also reuse the intermediate results of an operation inside the pipeline. Here is a high-level overview of the ISA extension. A few of the instructions are used for loading data, for prefetching the data, for checking the availability of the loaded data, and for managing a series of operations inside the same iteration. Here is an overview of the execution of one iteration. As we've already mentioned, the vector lane um, consists of paths that are across different disjoint subgraphs, meaning we can process them in parallel. First, we load the data values for each vector lane. Then we prefetch the next data lane, the, the next vector lane of paths. Once the current vector lane is ready, we can prepare the sequence of instructions that is dependent on the graph algorithm that we're executing. And then we process the edges inside the vector lane with respect to these operations. Now let's go over the system that we've designed. We simulate the Fugaku hardware using GEM5. We use the widely used LIGRA framework and we implement our partitioning as an extension to it. We test on three applications that were implemented in this framework and we select data sets from the sweet sparse matrix collection. To evaluate our results, we design two experiments. In the first experiment, we only load the input vectors of each iteration in VIA. And in the second experiment, we load both the input and the output in VIA. Keep in mind that these experiments only mirror the results of the hardware implementation with very simple partitioning. We expect to have even more speed up once we link the hardware to our own partitioning scheme. Here is the speed up that we got for the PageRank application. As you can see, in the case where we have both inputs and outputs in VIA, we can get a speed up of up to 4x. We also test the speed up with respect to different L2 cache sizes for the PageRank application and the Enron data set. As you can see, in both cases, we have a speed up, but in the second case, we have um, more of a speed up since the starting speed up was more to begin with. To conclude, we've seen that vector processors do not perform well with compressed formats. We propose LAVIA, a hardware software co-design. On the software side, we propose a partitioning scheme that exploits locality to increase cache hit rate and enables parallel execution with guaranteed atomicity. On the hardware side, we use a smart scratch pad memory that utilizes the bandwidth. And we've seen that the LAVIA outperforms the baseline by, 2 point, by 2x when we only upload the inputs and by 3.5x when we upload both the inputs and the outputs. Uh, thank you for your time. 
um, I'm glad to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Shannon. Um, maybe quick uh, questions uh, from the uh, from the audience. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Um, so in, in that last slide, you said that on the software side, you actually guarantee atomicity. Yes. Uh, can you can you explain how that happens? How are you guaranteeing atomicity? OK, so our partitioning scheme divides the graph into disjoint subgraphs. For example, here, the dashed square will represent two disjoint subgraphs. So in each iteration, we will take paths from different subgraphs. For example, we'll take this purple path here and this blue path over here. And we will execute these in parallel. And because the, the subgraphs are disjoint, we don't share any nodes or any edges. So we can just run these in parallel without requiring the data from the different paths. And after we finished processing the subgraphs, we can then move on to process the inter subgraph edges that actually do share a few nodes with each other. So this, this part wouldn't have guaranteed atomicity, but the part where we're processing the subgraphs in parallel would have guaranteed atomicity. Can the software part on your proposal be automated or it has to be done manually? Um, not, not necessarily now in your work, but I mean, uh, looking into the future as well. Um, we've added um, a pass to the LIGRA framework. Um, this could be done manually, but like we enable it whenever we want to run. It's like defined as a it's defined as a define function in the code. So like when we compile it, we can either compile that part or we can compile it without partitioning. So it, it can be automated or not. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Avnam. Uh, I okay. think, uh, uh, thank you. This concludes the undergraduate session with the three undergraduate talks. And now we move to the graduate session. Uh, and the first talk is by Tarun Solansky. Uh, title is SpecPref, High-Performing Speculative Attacks, Resilient Hardware Prefetchers. Aaron? Yeah. yeah. I'll just share you. the screen, yeah. Um, I hope it is visible. Yeah, is it visible? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Tarun Solanki, and I'll be presenting SpecPref, High Performing Speculative Attacks Resilient Hardware Prefetchers. Now, what is transient execution attacks? These exploit the side effects left in the microarchitecture to leak some secret data. Some of the well known examples are Spectre, Meltdown, Foreshadow, and LPI. Now, there have been many mitigation strategies that have been proposed against these transient execution attacks, but the one that we'll be focusing on is Muon Trap. Now, let's see what Muon Trap talks about. It prevents against the spectre-like attacks by adding a small speculative L0 filter cache between the core and the L1. It is of very small size, which is only 2 KB. The speculative state resides in the filter caches, and the non-speculative state resides in the lower level of the cache, like the L1 cache or the L2 caches and further on. Now, when a context switch arrives at the core, the filter caches are invalidated so that the attacker doesn't view the hidden speculative state of the adversary. But what about the hardware prefetchers? The speculative memory accesses are invoking the prefetchers at different levels of the cache hierarchy. Now, the prefetchers are indirectly triggering the changes in the non-speculative cache state. Now, the difference from Muon trap that is given is that to trigger the prefetchers based only on the committed instruction stream rather than the speculative accesses. This also has some performance implications. The increased lateness in bringing the prefetch blocks degrades the overall performance of the system. Now, this plot represents the average and maximum performance slowdown with the Muon trap implementation, with the state of the art prefetchers at different levels compared to the insecure baseline. The baseline that we have used here is the insecure prefetching technique that prefetches even during the speculative execution. At the L1i, we have used FNLMMA. At the L1d, we have used IPCP. And at the L2C, we have used Bingo, SPP, and PPF. For the instruction prefetchers, we have used client server benchmarks. And for the uh, data prefetchers, we have used PEG 2017 benchmarks. But how will the performance be improved with the prefetchers by still maintaining security? 
let's look at the previous approach called as the ghost nodes now ghost nodes is implementing ghost prefetching it is issuing all the prefetch requests during speculation itself but stores these prefetches in a small ghost buffer this also has some pitfalls the 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 ghost nodes implementation is evaluating the performance using only the conventional stride based prefetches ghost nodes does not consider any instruction prefetches it also does not consider any degree or distance characteristic of the prefetches it uses only a small eight entry ghost buffer for the l1 d prefetcher it induces thrashing with aggressive prefetches like ipcb now let's look at our approach that is spectrum we are using montrac as the base architecture now we balance the prefetching load between the two caches first of all the speculative prefetching is being done in the speculative filter cache and the on commit prefetching is being done in the non speculative cache this reduces the tendency of thrashing in the small speculative filter cache we have also added a speculative prefetch cache which is probed concurrently to the l2 this is analogous to the l0 cache for the l1 let's look at the working of spectre in the first step when a speculative demand request arises at the prefetcher the prefetcher is conservatively and speculatively prefetching in a speculative cache now conservative prefetching here means that the prefetcher is being given a statically defined limit on the number of prefetches that can be issued this is avoiding thrashing in the small speculative cache in the third step the commit of the instruction arrives the prefetcher table is updated and the on commit pending requests are also issued by the prefetcher in the fourth step this particular block is returned through to the non speculative cache and the on commit prefetches are also brought directly to the non speculative cache now this plot represents the average and maximum performance load on with the three techniques mon trap spectrif and ghost nodes the spectrif implementation is reducing the average performance load on to even lesser than 1.17 percentage for the bingo and even lesser than that that for the others the ghost nodes implementation is suffering from thrashing due to complete speculative prefetching in the small ghost buffer this plot represents the sensitivity analysis for the l0 instruction cache using the fnl mmm prefetcher implementing spectrif implementation normalized to the insecure baseline we have used peak actai to evaluate the different access latencies for the different capacities when moving from 2 kb to the 4 kb implementation the performance is improving this is because the access latency is equivalent but as soon as we move from 4 to 8 and then 16 to 32 the performance drops because the access latency becomes the bottleneck this plot represents the sensitivity analysis for the l0 data cache for the ghost prefetching and the spectrif implementation normalized to an insecure baseline using the ipcp prefetcher the ghost nodes implementation is improving the performance because it has reduction in thrashing because the capacity of the cache is increasing the spectrif is again showing the same pattern as for the instruction cache this plot represents the sensitivity analysis for the speculative prefetch cache for the bingo spp and ttf prefetcher using ghost nodes and spectrif implementation spectrif is showing a better performance even with the smaller speculative prefetch cache than the ghost nodes implementation this is because we have a distribution of the prefetches between the speculative prefetch cache and the l2 cache but ghost nodes requires a larger speculative prefetch cache to perform better that's all from my side thank you thank you taran any questions for taran uh i have a question taran a uh, very nice talk um yeah. Uh, if you go back to the diagram where you were showing this, uh, the prefetcher setup with the split between the, yeah. uh, yes, right here. Um, are you sharing metadata for the speculative and non-speculative prefetches? So, is there some some common uh, uh, learning that's happening for both sets of patterns, or do you have those separated inside the prefetcher? So, so that is like a same learning for both, but but the learning is allowed only after the uh, instruction commits. so the learning is not affected by any speculative demand request but learning is only affected when the instruction gets committed so prefetching table is updated only when we have the commit of the instruction oh i see so so everything that's non speculative will never see you won't even get any hints from the training side of this then uh, uh, i didn't get that uh, so, sorry so when when the speculative side is is issuing prefetch requests right um yeah. None of that will influence anything, even through the prefetcher state, about how the non-speculative cache. Uh, yes, yes, that will not influence anything inside the prefetcher as well. Okay, the cool. Uh, is going to use only the old learning that it already had. Got it. 
Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. Um, yeah, thank you, Taryn, for the presentation. That's really interesting. Um, I'm curious to know why you guys picked Muon Trap and not another defense. I mean, I know there's many of them. I, I know you couldn't possibly understand all of them, but um, you know, it's just I'm curious why you you've kind of like hammered on that one. Yeah, so we went through other uh, implementations like InvisiSpec as well, but that didn't discuss much about hardware prefetching as such. So this this Moan trap implementation was discussing like it it is using on commit prefetching to to allow hardware prefetching, but other techniques didn't have a mention anything as such like that. So we just stick to Moan trap implementation. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tarun. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Next, uh, we have Liu Liu. And the talk is Transformers Acceleration with Dynamic Sparse Attention. Liu Liu, it's all yours now. Absolutely. Yeah, we see you. Um, let me share my screen and. Uh, uh, yeah, you see to, your screen. You guys need to just, just reserve this. But I, I think we have to yeah. be this. I just have to give me five minutes. Sorry about the interruption. No worries. Um, let me share it. I it's already booked. I will book this. Really sorry about it. Has some uh, issue with the the room resume. Can you see my slides and hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Let's no way that get started. Hi everyone. My name is Liu Liu I'm from UC Santa Barbara. In this talk, I will present our work on transformer acceleration with dynamic sparse attention. So these days, transformers have become the mainstream in natural language processing, such as uh, uh, translation, you know, la uh, language understanding, and generative modeling. But using self-attention uh, enables the handling of long-range dependencies, which contributes to the success of transformers. However, attention processing is challenging especially when input sequences are long, such as um, document retrieval, uh, text classification, and image processing. While being able to capture long range uh, representations, the downside of self-attention is the quadratic time and space complexity as shown in this figure. When we have long sequences, the computation for attention score and outputs scales uh, quadratically with sequence length. And another figure here shows the breakdown of operations into attention and others. We can see that as the sequence length increases, attention is becoming at the bottleneck. Uh, given this problem, many studies propose some sort of transformer variance to reduce the computations of attention. One straightforward way is to explore the uh, intrinsic redundancy in attention and to have some uh, sparse patterns that mask out unimportant attentions as shown in this figure. One recent work used a combination of global, local, and random sparse attention. However, this method explores sparse um, uh, static or fixed patterns that could restrict many important uh, attention connections. A common motivation for sparse attention method is that not all attention probabilities are important. A large number of tensions do not contribute to the output. What we find interesting is that the sparse patterns in tensions are naturally dynamic and data dependent, as shown in this figure. Only a small amount of uh, attention probabilities are uh, useful. And more importantly, these uh, strong attentions are showing dynamically and uh, depending on the input sequence. And different, uh, different heads in attention also show different patterns. So intuitively, prior work using static sparse patterns cannot capture dynamically changing attention. With that, the question we care about is how to efficiently and effectively find the uh, dynamic sparse patterns. We formulate the process of identifying important uh, attention connections as a prediction problem. Uh, here it shows the computation flow of full attention. Now we present the dynamic sparse attention method. Basically, our method is to leverage uh, trainable approximation to predict sparse patterns, as shown in this figure. We use a prediction path based on low rank transformation and low precision computation. These prediction paths will process input sequences. Functionally, it is similar to original query and key transformation, but at much lower computational cost. And given the prediction result that approximate uh, original tension scores well, 
we can search for important connections with thresholding based on the magnitude of prediction result. And with these patterns, computations for attention score and outputs now become sparse. Now let's have a look at our evaluation results. We use the long range arena benchmark three to evaluate model accuracy. The sequence length is from 1K, 2K, and 4K, as shown in this figure. Our DSA method can achieve up to 95% attention sparsity without suffering from accuracy loss. We also compare with a recent work on attention approximation, and our method is more accurate on finding sparse patterns uh, at the same level of uh, attention sparsity while using a smaller amount of additional computations. To have a better understanding, we show the breakdown of full precision operations and energy consumption. For the computation saving, uh, our DSA method can reduce 2.8x to 4.3x uh, computations without accuracy loss. And note that uh, the computations in DSA prediction uh, are reduced to 25% and in fixed 0.4 bit precision. So we use this um, relative energy consumption to show that the cost of uh, DSA prediction is uh, small. Now as for the um, mapping on hardware, here I just discussed some implications. So firstly, on GPUs, we can use off-the-shelf sample dense matrix multiplication kernel uh, and the sparse matrix multiplication kernel to accelerate uh, dynamic sparse attention. Uh, of course, the sparsity ratio needs to be high, uh, but if this is the case in DSA uh, we can achieve. And we can also explore um, column vector sparse encoding as shown here uh, to get more speed ups uh, when some accuracy loss is acceptable. And we can further customize kernel design to better support the DSA prediction. Um, besides uh, special hard hardware is of course uh, promising to fully exploit the potential speed up uh, from dynamic sparse attention. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention and I will take questions. Thank you, Liu Liu. Uh, questions for Liu Liu? How do you manage the, the applications so that they have to go through a post-processing or a manual setup before they, they can be run on the system? Sorry, I mean, uh, so I don't quite get your question. You mean running on like real systems? Right, when you execute the, the benchmarks that, that you mentioned, but eventually yeah, yeah. you are changing all the, the sparse attention computation. Does this mean that the application changes as well or not? Or basically you have to change it so that it uses the your proposal? Oh, oh. I, I, what I'm, from what I'm saying is that we can uh, kind of re replace the the standard self-attention uh, implementation, for example, in like in PyTorch, and we uh, need to wrap up uh, GPU kernels, like sparse GPU kernels, to uh, to like uh, accelerate the application. I I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Liu Liu? No. Okay. Thank you, Liu Liu. Um, the last uh, presentation in the graduate session is by uh, Nelu uh, Kalani, and the uh, title is Instruction Criticality Based Energy Efficient Hardware Data Prefetching. Nelu, go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi. Let me just share my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Neelu and I'm going to talk about instruction criticality based energy efficient hardware data prefetching. So I'm going to talk about what do we care about, then why do we care about it and what have we done about it. So this figure shows a basic idea of data prefetching where the prefetcher monitors the access pattern of the core and tries to provide cache hits by predicting the core's future accesses. This ultimately results in performance improvement and state-of-the-art data prefetchers are highly competitive in providing speedup as this plot shows and provide similar speedup with an average gap of less than 4%. So the pro of speed up, uh, data prefetching is that they provide speedup, but the con is that they also increase the energy consumption in the memory hierarchy due to the additional requests that are going there. 
in an ideal case what we would want is to have as less energy consumption as possible with as high speed up as possible however we do not live in an ideal world so data prefetchers discuss the speed up that they provide but not the energy consumption that they cause in the memory subsystem this plot shows that then in data centers 70% of the energy consumption comes from servers and breakdowning uh, breakdowning the energy consumption in server 12% of it comes from memory and data prefetchers can further increase the memory hierarchy energy consumption and this is exactly what we try to uncover for existing data prefetchers in this work so this plot shows the uh, energy consumption with data prefetchers in the memory subsystem and show that uh, in dynamic energy the increase can be as high as 120% and with static energy it can be as high as 26% uh, here we show the energy model for gaseous dram and interconnect and we also model power getting at l2 llc and dram so the increase in dynamic energy consumption is due to the uh, increase in the memory requests that occur due to prefetching this plot shows uh, dynamic energy consumption with prefetchers for certain prefetcher friendly benchmarks and some un prefetcher unfriendly benchmarks and we see that there is a significant increase in dynamic energy consumption for both of these categories whereas if we try to look at static energy consumption the, the lower the execution time due to speed up provided by the prefetcher the lower should be the static energy consumption however in the presence of power gating this is not always the case for example let's say that all the requests from the core are actually getting served at the l1d cache itself and not going to the l2 then l2 can be power gated which saves static energy consumption but with prefetcher let's say that there's some prefetch request that ends up going to the l2 and it cannot be power gated anymore which results in increase in static energy consumption here we show the increase in static energy consumption for certain benchmarks and if we if we focus in the client one uh, client 001 we see that for dram there is an increase in static energy with all the prefetchers but with the bingo prefetcher the uh, st overall static energy consumption reduces that is because of high performance improvement so the increase in static energy is due to low performance improvement as well as increase in cache and dram activity there are existing works that discuss the uh, prefetching only for critical instructions as they are the only ones that matter to performance however uh, if we look at whether it's a reliable approach or not then we can see that the, there are thousands of load ips and only a few of them are actually critical to performance so this approach can act, help us retain speed up from the prefetcher and also reduce the energy consumption the prior work does have some limitations for example fpp marks ips as critical aggressively catch performs higher operations per cycle focus prefetching also performs higher operations per cycle and uses preset thresholds that are not always optimal for all benchmarks and subramanian et al's technique is ineffective in critical ip detection so to uh, to address these limitations our proposal is to use rob occupancy as a metric for critical ip detection here we show that the average rob occupancy for ips that cause 90% of the rob stalls is higher than the ips that cause remaining stalls which can help us distinguish between them the same is true for stalls per kilo cycles so we use rob occupancy and the stall frequency to detect critical ips whenever an ip stalls the head of the rob we check the rob occupancy and uh, note it in the critical ip training table and then we uh, check the history against some reliance thresholds to finally mark it as critical this incurs a storage overhead of 1.4 kilobytes and also performs lower operations per cycle we also perform prefetcher specific threshold relaxation wherein we prefetch for all ips in one window and critical ips in another window and check the performance difference to decide whether we are going to reduce the thresholds or not thus we show that we we, we uh, achieve dynamic energy savings with all prefetchers and static energy savings with ipcp and ppf with speed up loss of less than 5% or 94% of the benchmarks we also compare our technique with prior work and show that it is more effective in terms of uh, retaining speed up and uh, energy savings 
and we show that even though it, it is most conservative in detecting critical IPs with modest coverage, it is still able to retain the speed up and performs lower operation per cycle than certain other techniques. In conclusion, we uncover the energy consumption due to data prefetching and show an increase in both dynamic and static energy in the memory subsystem and propose instruction criticality based data prefetching for energy efficiency while using ROB occupancy as a metric to detect critical IPs and also use runtime threshold tuning. Thus, we are able to retain speed up with lower energy consumption in the memory subsystem. That's it from my side. Thank you. And uh, any questions? Thank you, Mary. Any questions? Oh, I've got one. Uh, Neelu, uh, nice job. Yes. Um, uh, I actually Thank wanted you. to understand what you meant by operations per cycle. Are you talking about how to update the metadata? Okay, so the operations per cycle, what I'm focusing on here is to identify critical IP candidates. So for example, um, if I go towards this slide, uh, this technique, catch, it, uh, it enumerates data dependency graph in hardware. So mm -hmm. for every, so it needs to track every instruction that retires to find out the critical path with the data dependency graph. So in each cycle, it, it uh, uses, it uh, uses, it performs retire with number of compare operations to check the maximum, the maximum cost path for that particular instruction so that it can find the actual critical path uh, the, and then uh, take the loads from that critical path. So, so, so it actually needs, in terms of let's say compare operation or uh, addition, subtraction, ALU operation, those okay. are the kind so, of- so, so I guess, uh, just, just so I can understand real quick, like uh, uh, I'll go to work that I'm more familiar with, the focus prefetching work, right? That's basically counting stall cycles. You would exactly. calculate different additions as as different operations. Is that how you're telling it, or one operation per cycle? Yes. Oh, so, so so the addition would be the operation. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. How do you update uh, the number of IPs tracked? Meaning that obviously a lot of IPs may appear during the the execution of a of a program, so some may become older, some are the newer, so how do you decide on uh, which ones do you replace if you have a limited size? Uh, yes, yes. So uh, we use actually the LRU replacement policy, but we tried to change, we tried to do some other things on it, but it didn't have much of an impact uh, because most of the benchmarks that we use, they, uh, they actually have the total number of critical IPs are around 200 and we use around 128 entries in the table for detecting, for ca capturing the critical IPs. So it's actually, uh, there is not a lot of conflict going on there, but uh, whenever it happens, we use LRP. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There is a, a question from the audience. Uh, are you measuring power or energy? An accurate prefecture will improve performance and not affect energy. Oh yeah, okay. So how are we measuring energy? So here I describe, so here is the energy model that we're using. So we use peak acti to model the energy of the caches. And this is the information, like we use the seven nanometer technology and we use some other references to also model DRAM and interconnect uh, energy as well. And uh, yes, in the case of a, a prefetcher, which is 100% accurate, which also, in, uh, which also avoids inaccurate prefetch request, and it, it, it is perfectly timely as well, then yes, there won't be an increase in the energy consumption. And that would be the ideal case. Uh, did I answer the question? I, I think uh, the audience, uh, uh, they, they can type. Uh, so- uh, Are you measuring I, power it, or energy? It, it, it's been confirmed. Uh, so okay. uh, thank you, Heiner Litz, and thank you, Nelu. So this thank concludes you. the session. Thank you very much. I would, uh, you know, me and uh, my co-chair, uh, Jesper Eckert would like to uh, congratulate all the six presenters because 
uh, the uh, top three, uh, uh, let's say, contenders in each category is recognized by ACM. And uh, we would like to also thank uh, the judges and also all the attendants. Uh, we will announce the, uh, the, the top uh, one, two, three, the ranking in tomorrow's award ceremony. Thank you very much for attending the session.